right, good morning, church. How you guys doing this morning? Haley, I think they're scared of this. I'm just kidding. Hey, you guys stand. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring. Chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the king. to save is here to set the captives free for who could stop the Lord the Lord Almighty, who could stop the Lord Almighty, who could stop the Lord Almighty, no one, oh, who could stop the Lord, let's declare that this morning, who could stop the Lord Almighty, who could stop the Lord Almighty, Good to see you guys. Would you take, let's see, I gave last service a minute and two seconds. Can you do it in a minute and one? Nate says no. So a minute it is. And uh, say hi to the folks here.
As you make your way back to your seat, finish up your conversation, would you pray with me this morning? God, thank you for today. God, thank you for um, another opportunity to gather together, God, to be in your presence, to worship you, to give you the praise that you are so due. God, you're so worthy of it. Um, God, we remember your, your love and your goodness and your grace towards us this morning. God, so we uh, gladly lift our voices. God, lift our hands to worship you this morning, the creator of all things. God, I pray um, just in a little bit as we hear from your word, as you teach us something this morning, God, help us to grow closer to you. God, pray these things in your name. Son of heaven rose again. Oh, tremble death, where's your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord.
Yeah, we come with that express purpose today, to hail King Jesus, the Savior of the world. So even if you had chosen not to send your son, uh, you would have been worthy of our complete praise, honor, and glory, just as our creator. You spoke this world into existence. You spoke every one of us into existence. And we pushed back. We rebelled. To that end, you send your son to live the life you're supposed to live, die and rise again, that we might reconnect with you. We might be related to you. So yeah, we do sing, all hail King Jesus. And yet, Lord, you have 
not taking us home. You've put us here on earth for a purpose, for a reason. You said your church is going to be your vehicle to reach a world who doesn't know, who doesn't really care. Uh, maybe in a crisis we'll give God a quick thought, but not much beyond that. And you said you want the church to be your vehicle to reach that world. And we're one local expression of your greater church. So, Lord, we think you've uh, called us specifically, uniquely, to be Christ in our community. And today we want to pray for a, a unique group among us, those that are fathers and are father figures. What a unique calling. What an awesome privilege. What an awesome responsibility. So we pray that you'd fill those who are biological fathers and father figures with your spirit, that they'd represent you well to those under their influence, in their sphere of influence. Lord, that you would move your name, your reputation forward through these men. And Lord, beyond this group, we pray for us as a body. Yeah, that you'd be pleased and you'd expand our influence so we could have a greater footprint of reflecting you well. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, North Point. My name is Taylor, and these are your North Point Community Highlights. If you're new with us this morning, we'd love to get more connected with you. You can either fill out the QR code in the seat back in front of you or up on the screen and get a free cup of coffee on us. And if you'd like to give today, you can either drop your cash or check in the black boxes by the main entrances or on our Give tab on our website. Happy Father's Day. We appreciate all of you. Dads or father figures, grab a root beer on your way out. All on Sunday is going to be July 2nd, which means we're going to have one service at 10 a.m. inside with a lunch to follow at 11.15. We're having firehouse box lunches, and this week it'll be $7 per person, or you can bring your own lunch. You can register for the lunch on the events tab on our website, and the deadline is Wednesday, June 28th at 5 p.m. VBS starts tomorrow. It'll be Monday through Thursday, 6 p.m. to 8.15 p.m. It's never too late to sign up your kids, and you can even walk in. Our all church retreat deadline is coming up very soon. Our sign up deadline is July 4th, and the retreat is Friday, August 4th through the 5th. We have a limited number of rooms, and they're all filling up. For details and pricing, you can go to our events tab on our website. And lastly, we want to share a video from our North Point mission team that recently got back from the Dominican Republic. And after that, Andy's going to come up and continue with our Reliance series.
Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Boy, if you came, if this is one of your first time, one of your first times to come, we sure appreciate you doing that. We know it's hard to step out sometimes. Um, if you're joining us online, thanks for doing that. We're, we're glad you're here. So before I jump into what I want to say, I got to tell you, um, a little bit of my bluster got exposed yesterday. So since we started North Point, I've always badgered the worship pastors or worship leaders, can I be a part of the worship team? And most of them have said they're praying about it. And, and Blake's t- taken a different tack. He said, sure, here's a microphone. And, and I, always, I always back out. <laughs> well, yesterday, I was officiating a funeral, and they said, hey, we're going to do a cu- couple corporate songs. Could you lead those? And I thought, no, that's a bad idea. I, 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 I want you guys to treasure this memory, and that would wreck it. So, so I had my chance and I chickened out. So I need to, from all time here, just shut up about the. So a little boy, I lived in the Detroit area. I grew up following the Detroit Lions. I had a favorite player. His name was Mickey Zofko. Mickey Zofko was like about a four-string running back, but his job on the kickoff coverage team was, was the wedge breaker. Now, what I'm about to describe is no longer legal in the National Football League, but back in the day, you'd kick the ball off, and the guy would receive it, and two or three guys would get in front, and they'd form a wedge, and they'd go up the field. And Mickey Zofko's job was at the 40-yard line to run down as fast as he could and throw himself lengthways into that wedge and take out as many guys as he could so somebody else could make the tackle. Often, he had to be helped off the field. There were times they'd have to give him smelling salts because he got knocked out because of the contact. But for the next kickoff, he was there to break the wedge. That's quite a sacrifice for a team, don't you think? I mean, he doesn't even get credit for a tackle. Somebody else makes the tackle. He does that to save his team five or ten yards. But it brings up the subject of sacrifice in life. Who or what is worthy of our fullest sacrifice? Well, I want us to think about that today. So if you've got a Bible, if you'd open it to 2 Samuel chapter 23, um, we're going to go all the way through this chapter, and we're going to wrestle with the question, who or what is worthy of our fullest sacrifice? Now, if you haven't been with us, we have been in the books of 1 and 2 Samuel since right after the Vietnam War ended. Not really. We've been in there a while. And some of you thought, we're never going to finish. Jesus is going to come back. Well, unless Jesus comes back, we're going to finish next week, people. And woo, I know, July 2nd, we're going to start in the Psalms. It's going to be glorious. But this has been Israel's transition from a um, loose federation of states to a monarchy. Um, in the process, they wanted a king. God said, I don't think this is a good idea. They finally badgered him up. Okay, you can have, so you know I'm the king you need. You can have one of his first king's name was Saul. He didn't do well. David was the next king. David did pretty well, though he compromised in a couple areas, and there was uh, severe consequences for that. Well, we're at the end of this saga, of this transition, and the last four chapters are not chronological, but the narrator adds them just to give us some more insight into David's life and his leadership. So that's where we are in 2 Samuel 23, and David starts this way. He says, now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares, and he describes himself, the man who was raised on high declares, the anointed of the God of Jacob. So he's, he's saying, I was one who was raised up. David was a shepherd boy. After Saul failed as king, God said to the prophet Samuel, I want you to go to uh, Jesse and his sons, because his the next king is among those sons. So uh, Jesse got all his sons together, and Samuel went down the row. No, 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 uh, and not here. Do you have another son? And, and, and Jesse said, yeah, I got one more, but he's a shepherd. It can't be him, can it? Yeah, go get him. And that was David. I mean, Dad didn't even think enough to bring him on to line up. David said, I was the lowest of the low. And God raised me up. And he anointed me. And under David, Israel reached some of its heights of security and possessing the land. And yet, as we will see, David was a flawed king. Well, if you've heard me speak before, you know, June is always kind of a poignant month for me. Because 21 years ago, uh, Hope and I were in the middle of a job search for me. 
our kids were 10 months old and three and a half years, and, and I had gone to Indiana, and I thought that was the job, and it didn't work out, and I had a responsibility. To, we got back on a Thursday, and I had a responsibility at church on that Sunday, and we put the kids to bed Sunday night, and I said, Hope, do I need to go to Arapahoe Community College tomorrow? And that would be their version of SEC to me with a career counselor because obviously the pastor thing, it just is not, not going to work out. And he said, well, Andy, um, yeah, I'd like to give it till Christmas, and then, and then we'll see. Okay, okay. I think at that point she believed in my call more than I believed in my call. Well, that Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, I got a call from Lincoln Berea, and uh, I had put in a, a resume for a singles pastor job in October. I hadn't heard anything. I thought it was filled, but they hadn't filled it, and they wanted to know, are you available for an interview? It's like, you do not know how available I am for an interview. <laughs> Like when? Well, I got to preach next Sunday, but otherwise I am wide open. And so, but in that process of looking for the job, I had been um, accepted as a church planter for, in Arizona for the Southwest Conservative Baptist Association. They said, look, in, in Phoenix, they're clearing 28 acres a day for development. They're getting 7,000 new people a month. So in three and a half years, you're going to move all of Lincoln to Phoenix. And evangelicals can't keep up. You work for campus. You say, we think you'd be a great church planner. Well, I don't know anybody in Phoenix. Can I meet some people? Well, we're having a conference next month. I'll be there. And what I found out in that conference is this. If you're going to plan a church, you better have resources, people, and upfront money. Because I met lots of guys who were committed whose plans were failing. I thought, well, that'll, that'll, that'll never happen. Took the singles pastor position. And a year later, senior pastor, Brian Clark, said, hey, we want to plan a church. We'd love to have you lead it. You can recruit anybody. We'll give and, and I feel blessed. I feel like God took me from and raised me to this position. I was, I was spent. I'd given up. I'm wondering, as you look at your life, where do you see God at work? His anointing, his favor, raising you up. David certainly feels that way. Well, he goes on. He says, and the sweetest psalmist of Israel. Verse 2, David understands that God is speaking through him. He says, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me. And his word was on my tongue. So God is speaking through me. We understand that God anointed certain people to speak and write his word, and David's one of them. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel spoke to me. So David's making the case. God's speaking through me. What is it about? Since David was a ruler, he speaks about leadership. Here's what God says. He who rules over men righteously, who rules in the fear of God, that kind of person does what? Verse 4 is as the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs out of the earth through sunshine after rain. You all remember when the sun breaks through? What a glorious thing it is. That's a righteous ruler. And, and when the rain comes and when you combine the rain with the sun, well, that brings growth. David, God through David is saying, that kind of ruler brings favor to a land. They're blessed. They flourish. I spent the 93-94 school year in Siberia, the campus ministry. In the fall of 93, they were having an election. And you remember, we were, the wall had come down in 89, and there was the hope that democracy would spring forth in Russia. So I say to a student one time, you're going to vote? He said, no, I'm not going to vote. No, I'm not going to vote. Man, why not? Because Andy, you can call them czars. You can call them Bolsheviks. You can call them communists. You can call them what you will. They're all corrupt. That's our people. They're all corrupt. He said, you watch. Whoever wins will vote themselves a pay raise. And sure enough, the ruling party got in, and they vote themselves, vote themselves a pay raise. It's like you've seen this before. Why do I say that? You know, we can look at these verses, and we should rightly apply them to people in Washington, D.C., and in Lincoln, and on our school boards, and our leadership everywhere. But if we think, oh, it's all about them and not about us, we're mistaken. Spent three years in seminary, and there's certain phrases that stay with me. But this was October of 96. We were about a month out from the presidential election. Everybody was talking, ooh, what's going to happen? One of these professors says, America will get what she deserves in this election. Friends, that has stayed with me. 
It's easy to say, all those people, no, 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 we'll get what we deserve. We want just leaders. Are we just people? We have, all of us have certain levels of influence and power. How do we use that? So when we moved here, we were living, I hired on at Breen, we were living down south. We built a house down at 93rd and Old Cheney, and we were on a cul-de-sac, and we kind of grew up with four families. Our kids were little, and they'd ride bikes, and they'd play on the cul-de-sac there, and we got to know those neighbors well, and it's, those are the kind of people I feel like I would easily call at 2 in the morning if I was in a crisis. I knew them that well. But Hope and I would say on the married couples, who has the power in that room? How about the one across the street? Well, that, you know, how about our neighbors? Who? And so we'd, we'd often wonder, well, who, who would they say has the power in our relationship? If you're a married person, are you being just? Are you being fair with your spouse? So when our kids were little and I was at Berean and I'd preach, um, they had a Saturday night service. So Hope would say to me, well, well do you need to, to work on your sermon? No, 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 I had all week to work on my sermon. I can take the kids today. That, that's not right. I, I've had many hours. Lincoln Breen accords me many hours to work on the sermon. To play Saturday, the Saturday card, the uh, sermon card, it, it's not right. So I'm, Andy, I'm not married. Okay, but, but you got a roommate. you got friends. you got influence there. you got power. How are you using that? I remember in school, the, the attractive people, the good athletes, the, the smart people, they had influence. People wanted their approval. If you got that kind of influence, how are you using it? You just? Do you understand? As David said, the righteous ruler is the one who fears God because they may get enamored with their power and think they won't answer to him, but they, if you fear God, you, will, you understand you will answer to God. For all the influence we have, we may get away with it here, but we will give an answer to God. If you're a parent, are you being fair with your kids? Well, look, when they're 8 or 10 or 12, they don't have much earning power. There's not much they can do or say. But we'll give an answer. Yeah, we need leaders who fear God for sure, that they might rule righteously. But are we people who are fearing God and are living righteously, understanding that every decision, every word spoken, we will give an account to God? Well, David takes a personal aside here in verse 5 because he was not a leader who was totally above board. He did abuse power, at least in one area, in collecting wives. And we got carried away, and he got one woman pregnant, and he couldn't figure it out. He had the husband murdered. So David takes a personal side just to talk about his rule. He says this, Truly is not my house so with God, for he has made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things and secured for all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not indeed make it grow? Uh, David, we saw in 2 Samuel 7, wanted to build a house for God. And God said, no, 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 I'm going to build a house for you. And your, your, your rule is going to be an eternal rule because your seed is going to be Jesus. And David said, God has locked in this eternal covenant with me, even though I wasn't the ideal leader. That, verses 6 and 7, we're back to the oracle, God speaking through David. He's talking about those rulers now who don't fear God and who do abuse power. Verses 6 and 7. But the worthless, every one of them, will be thrust away like thorns because they cannot be taken in hand. Think about a plant with thorns. You've got to be really careful. It's stuck. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of spear. If you're going to deal with an unjust ruler who does not know the fear of God, it may well come to armed conflict to get them out. And they will be completely burned with fire in their place. God is saying, one day these rulers will give an account to me and will face my judgment. It seems like some of the authoritarian people in our world are, are untouchable. But God says, I will judge one day. So we're talking about leadership, and we've established that the righteous one is the one who fears God because he knows, she knows, he or she is not all-powerful, that she will give an account. Though the world may say they have power, God says, I have ultimate authority. And we know David's not wasn't that kind of leader. He was a flawed leader. And yet he still garnered or engendered great loyalty from a group of men. And we transition to those men in verse 8. 
These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb, Bashebeth, Atakamite, chief of the captains. He was called Adino, the Esnite, because of 800 slain by him at one time. We're going to find out, we're going to look at the three of the mightiest of David's men. There were 600, but there were three that were elite. This is the first one. It says he slow, killed 800 people. Was it him or was it men under his command? I don't know. But in one sitting, he took out 800 people. Second one. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahoatite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle and the men of Israel had withdrawn. He arose and struck the Philistine until, the hand was, until his hand was weary and clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to strip the slain. Apparently people left, and he stayed and fought, brought the victory, and then soldiers came back to get the spoils of war. Third one. And after him was Shammah, the son of Aji, a Herite. And the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, probably a food supply as it might be, in jeopardy. And the people fled, fled from the Philistines. But he took a stand in the midst of the plot, defended and struck the Philistines. And the Lord brought about a great victory. So just a quick bio on the three mightiest of David's men. It is to set up what we're going to read in verses 13 to 17. The three of them, the three of the 30 chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time to the cave of Adullam. I'm in verse 13. While well, the troop of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephaim, David was then in the stronghold while the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. David had a craving and said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? For if he would not drink it, these things the three mighty men did. Let me set the stage. They're besieged by the Philistines. And they're in the camp. And David kind of is almost musing. He said, man, what do I do for a drink of water from that well? Well, these three men hear it and say, well, you know what? We're going to fight our way all the way through the Philistine lines to that well at Bethlehem, which was probably being watched. We're going to draw water, we're going to take it, and we're going to fight our way back, and we're going to give it to David. And when they explain what has gone on to David, David thinks, there is no way I can drink this water. The sacrifice that went into that, for a, that I am not, I'm not worthy of that kind of sacrifice. So what does he do with the water? He pours it out in a sacrifice. David saying, I, even though I'm Israel's greatest leader, I'm a flawed being. I, I'm not worthy of that kind of sacrifice. One is. It's God Almighty. And we would argue it's Jesus, God in the flesh. So see, we're, we're asking this question, who or what is worthy of our fullest sacrifice? Only Jesus. Only Jesus is worthy of our fullest sacrifice. Only Jesus. He's worthy of our fullest sacrifice. You know, people who experience Jesus uh, proclaim this over and over again. In the New Testament, the, after Jesus resurrected in the early days of the church, perhaps nobody carried the mission of Christ forward more than the Apostle Paul. He was a Pharisee. He was a Jewish leader. He was born in an elite family. He studied under Gamaliel, which is a the highest regarded of the, of the intellectuals. And he began to rise. And remember, Israel was a theocracy. He began to rise. And so he had both civil and spiritual authority. And he was on his way to Damascus to serve papers on Christians because he thought he was fighting for the Jewish faith and putting these infidels away. And God met him on that road. And he was blinded and he came to know Christ. Uh, later he went to the Philistines and planted a church and and he was writing a letter back to them. And he said, you know, in, in coming to Christ, uh, I, I had a pedigree. I, I, had, I was from the right family. I went to the right school. And I was growing 
in my career. And I've laid that all down. And I'd gladly do it. Here's, here's what he said in Philippians 3. Uh, For whatever things were gained to me. Remember I'm talking about his family, his education, his career, his position. Those things I've counted loss as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I caught all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Remember, we're talking family, we're talking education, we're talking career. He says this, and I count them but rubbish. That's a sanitized translation. That's dung. We'd use another word for it. But this is the Bible, so we're going to stay with rubbish so that I may gain Christ. All that stuff I had, I lost it. You know what? No thing. It was a sacrifice worth doing. Is there anything in your life, in my life, we think, oh, no, 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 you you can't have that. Because the people who've come to truly know Christ say, I'd lay it all down, and it's, it's a worthy deal. There's one who's worthy of our fullest sacrifice. His name is Jesus. We go back to our passage, and and we read a few more, about a few more men of David's mighty men. Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was the chief of the 30, and he swung his spear against 300 and killed them and had a name as well as the three. He was the most honored of the 30, therefore he became their commander. However, he did not attain to the three. Then Benaiah, the son of Joida, the son of a valiant man of Cabezel, who had done mighty deeds, killed the two sons of Ariel of Moab, and he also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. He killed an Egyptian, an impressive man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down with him with a club and snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things Benaiah, the son of Joida, did and had a name as well as the three mighty men. He was honored among the 30, but he did not attain to the three, and David appointed him over his guard. Um, verses 24 through 30 give a number of other names. I'll just point out two. The first one, Asahel, the brother of Joab. And the last one, Uriah, the Hittite, because they both died needlessly. Asahel was in a battle, and he chased Abner, and Abner kept telling him, turn back, turn back, turn back, turn back, and he wouldn't. He got run through with a spear. Didn't have to end that way. Uriah was the husband of Bathsheba. He was an honorable man. When David called him home, he wouldn't sleep with his wife because his men weren't engaged, didn't have that privilege. As a result of that, David felt like he had murder to cover his adultery. These these people died because of the consequences of sin, of rebellion. So we saw David, a flawed leader, these men break through the line and get the water and break, have to fight their way back and get this water and, and pour it out and say, you know what, I, I'm, not, I'm not worthy of that kind of sacrifice. So I want to ask you, who or what is getting your fullest sacrifice? Who or what is getting the bulk of your time and your money is a good way to ask that question. Yeah, I'm amazed, um, as I observe kids' activities, they ask for a lordship commitment. I mean, you get in sports, it is all time, every time. I was at the, uh, finishing my exercise class, I was at the gas station about 6.30, 7 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Here comes this mom in with this little girl, dressed in a softball uniform, going on their way to some tournament. I don't, I don't know what. But kids' activities will take everything. They will run your life. And parents, as you're thinking that through, I would begin to make the decision now. Who or what is worthy of your fullest sacrifice? Are you going to let these teams, this band, this debate team, this, I don't know. They're asking for your fullest sacrifice. Those those are hard questions to wrestle with. Your job. Internet. Man, you're available 24-7, right? I got a brother who does software design. He said, Andrew, I can be called anytime. If, if our product glitches at 10 o'clock at night, somebody's on a call, can you get on and fix that? You know that. You work software. Our jobs are asking for our fullest sacrifice. We get in a new relationship. We get a boyfriend or girlfriend. We'll give that 
person, our fullest sacrifice. It was my sophomore year at Texas A&M. I'm done with class, and I walk into the dorm room, and there is Mr. and Mrs. Wood, the parents of my roommate. And he had gotten a steady girlfriend that semester, and as his time spent with her went up, his grade point went down. And they had gotten midterm grades. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Wood. I think, I think I'll be going now. Oh, no, Andy, you don't have to go. And Jim said, no, 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 you, no, no, I got someplace to go. Where? I don't know, but I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. What had happened? This new relationship had gotten his fullest sacrifice. And yet David would say, and God in his word would say, there's none. Whose words are our fullest sacrifice and complete trust, and that's Jesus. And even Jesus himself, where he was on earth, modeled that for us. He lived a life, a sinless life. He was convicted, term and quotes, in a mockery of a trial. And, and you know, the, the night before this went down, he said, Lord, if it be your will, that this cup could pass. But it wasn't. And, and, and Jesus followed him, entrusted him, full of sacrifice. What is that? Life on a cross, crucified trusting that God would redeem that, and he did. He raised him up. The Bible said every knee bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the one that is worthy of our fullest sacrifice. When we struggle to give that to God, when we call out to this Christ who modeled that for us and can empower it for us, giving ourselves to him. My dad graduated from high school in um, 1943. And before he graduated, he went to enlist in the U.S. Air Force, because we were in the middle of World War II at that time. And when he graduated, he had not turned 18, and they wouldn't take you until you were 18. And then, because he graduated early, they gave him a six-month deferment. Well, he went in, he enlisted with a, a buddy in the Air Force, but that guy, when he was uh, graduated, was 18, so they took him right away. So that six-month deferment set off a conflict between my dad and his mom. Because my dad wanted to go right now when he turned 18, and his mother begged him not to go. And if you're a parent, you can understand that. And this conflict went on for about six weeks when my dad said, I'm out. I'm going. Mom, I, sorry, i got to go. Um, my dad ended up being a navigator on a B-29, and he had orders to Japan. They were on their last training mission when the bombs were dropped. Um, his buddy, they took right away, and there was a, kind of a dearth of people. They rushed him through training. He was shot down over Italy, and they never found him. Um, my dad graduated, I, I'm sorry, finished in the Air Force, went through the University of Maine on the GI Bill, and, and would come back to his little small town to visit parents and stuff, and it, it was so small. He would run into that buddy's mom on the street, and every time she saw him, or yeah, she saw him, she would start crying. Because there is my son's friend alive. And, and my dad said every time I saw her, it was a reminder of the cost of serving our country. People lost their lives. So he tells me that whole story, and I said, Dad. You know, knowing what you do now, you got three sons, you're married, you got three sons. If you were to do it again, what would you do? And he said, without question, I would have gone as soon as I turned 18. Why? Because they attacked us, man. I, I thought this country was worth defending. But, Dad, you could have lost your life. I understand it. But you had your son, son, it was a different day. You, you, you give your life because we were under attack. I admire that commitment, and I realize men and women do, have done it throughout our history. But my question is this. If a country, which is temporal, will have a start time and an end times, is worthy of that kind of sacrifice, how much more with the eternal creator? He is the one who is worthy of our fullest sacrifice. May we look to Jesus that we might empower us to give God our fullest sacrifice, just like he gave the Father his fullest sacrifice. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, 
we're challenged by your word. Um, David poured out the drink because he realized he wasn't worthy of that kind of sacrifice. Israel's greatest king poured it out, pointing us to the one who is worthy of our fullest sacrifice. His name is Jesus. Lord, that we would be empowered people, empowered to live full on, full on for you. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we might live that out. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. Join us in worship, whether that's standing or sitting or dancing right along. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up. Until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. the goodness of God. I love your voice, and you have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you goodness of God. All my life, and all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see the goodness of God. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Oh, your Thank you. 
will be faithful to us, God. God, a reminder that your goodness, your love, it's something we could never obtain on our own. Rather, it's coming after us, God. It it's never stops. You never stop chasing us down. God, I pray that when people look at us, people look at me, God, that they see you, God, that I am being faithful to you, growing closer to you. God, and because you've been so faithful to us, we can trust you. We can lay things down at your feet. God, so whatever that thing is, That's maybe taking too much time. God, that's preventing us from looking more like you. I pray that you would soften our hearts. God, I pray that we could lay that down at your feet. Surrender it to you. God, I uh, just want to pray for the fathers, father figures in this room. God, um, continue to strengthen them. God, would they look to you to lead? Would they look to you? Would they be men of, after your own heart? God, men of peace, men of love. God, I pray for those who this time uh, is hard. This time is difficult for them. I pray that you would wrap your loving arms around them. God, bring them peace in this time today. God, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being with us this morning. Hey, if you are a, a father, a father figure, grandpa, most dudes in here, don't forget to grab a root beer on your way out, and we'll catch you next time.